Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stephen Quint. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a partner here in, at Clayton Hits in Sydney, um, and I am Clayton Hits' resident American political, um, political junkie. And so it's, um, I'd like to begin today by acknowledging that we're conducting this session on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respect to their elders, past, present and emerging. I also extend that respect to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. Welcome to the session. The election is on 5 November in the US, which is 6 November here. And that's just three weeks or 22 sleeps away here in Australia. What we'll be doing today is I'll start the session with a short um, presentation, just setting the scene. And then we're very fortunate to have two panellists, Simon Jackman and Bruce Walpy, and I'll conduct a QA and a session with them to discuss really with a focus on polling in the election. So, um, just some brief background for those of you who don't know, but um, a camp, generally a campaign, a presidential election campaign is a marathon taking two years with primaries to select parties, candidates, then the general election. This campaign is unique in that it's effectively a 100-day sprint from the time of Biden's replacement by Harris until the general election. So it has a different dynamic to anything certainly I've seen in my lifetime and that I think many people can remember in recent times. Voting is not compulsory, and that's a major difference from Australian elections. And non-compulsory voting means money is even more important to fund getting out the vote. And of interest and of note is the fact that Kamala Harris has a significant fundraising advantage over Donald Trump in terms of money in the, ba money in the bank to be able to spend on campaigning, getting out the vote activities. There are... Um, the vote is not a popular vote for the president. The vote is a vote on states, and each of the state has representatives in a body called the Electoral College. There are 538 Electoral College votes. 270, therefore, is the magic number. A winning candidate needs to get 270 votes to become president and to win the majority in the Electoral Council, in the Electoral College. It's therefore a decentralised electoral system. There's not one single federal um, body that oversees the election. Each election is run by the individual um, electoral bodies and the individual states concerned. So it is, in effect, 51 separate, um, separate elections. Uh, even more, there are a couple of districts in states that, are set, that have their own separate electoral votes. But it's a decentralised electoral system. Um, now, in terms of the Electoral College, um, <clears throat> historically, in 2016, Biden, wa Trump won the Electoral College by 306 votes to 232, although he lost the popular vote by approximately 3 million. In 2020, it was almost, it was a mirror image in the other direction. Biden won the Electoral College by 306 votes to 232 but won the popular vote by approximately 7 million. Um, but in terms of the actual votes it took to change the election, you'll see from the slide that roughly, if roughly 70,000 votes changed, hand, changed their direction in each of the elections, the outcome would have been different. And you'll see the, uh, the states and the district that is relevant on the slide. A critical thing in the election, therefore, is not the overall vote and the overall popular vote. It's the vote in the swing states. And it's generally recognised that there are going to be seven states that change the election. And those states are listed there. And here is a map showing the impact of the states. You'll see that the swing states represent 93 out of the votes. And they're really grouped into two categories. The category at, in the north of the map, or really the Midwest, are Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. And they're known as the Rust Belt states. And in the south 
are four states, Nevada, Arizona, Georgia, and North Carolina. You'll see the number of electoral votes on the map, and they are known as the Sunbelt states. Now, the state I think you should probably pay the most attention to is Pennsylvania. It's critical. The renowned pollster Nate Silver gives it the highest tipping point state rating at 30%. Now, a tipping point state is the state most likely to be the state that determines the outcome, that will be the first state to take a candidate over the requisite number of votes in the Electoral College. And Nate Silver gives Trump a 91.7% and Harris an 87.5% chance of winning the election overall if they win Pennsylvania. Now, the noted American political advisor, James Carville, you remember him from the Bill Clinton days, had a famous quote about Pennsylvania, which is, Pennsylvania is Philadelphia and Pittsburgh and Alabama in between meaning it's two metropolitan areas with a conservative country in the middle. So it's a very tricky state. Now, um, what I thought I'd do just before we go to the panel discussion is I thought I would um, show you some campaign ads because the campaign ads provide a useful window to the campaign. And so I want to take you through a couple of these that are currently in play. Now, the first ad is how Trump portrays himself. Greatness doesn't discriminate. It doesn't see where you're from, what you look like, or who you know. Greatness is for those who work for it, for those who keep moving forward. Greatness is for anyone willing to fight for it. Well, others have different views of him. Of 100 Republicans who worked in national security for Presidents Reagan, both Bushes, and for President Trump, now endorsing Harris for president. She came up as a prosecutor, an attorney general, into the Senate. She has the kind of character that's going to be necessary in the presidency. Vice President Harris is standing in the breach at a critical moment in our nation's history. We have a shared commitment as Americans to do what's right for this country. This year, I am proudly casting my vote for Vice President Kamala Harris. Former generals, secretaries of defense, secretaries of the Army, Navy, and Air Force, CIA directors, and National Security Council leaders under Democratic and Republican presidents, Republican members of Congress, and even former Trump administration officials agree there's only one candidate fit to lead our nation, and that's Kamala Harris. I'm Kamala Harris, and I approve this now, here is one of the ads that the Trump campaign is using to define Kamala Harris. Well, if, if anything, would you have done something differently than President Biden during the past four years? Uh, there is not a thing that comes to mind in terms of, and I've been a part of, of, of most of the decisions that have had impact. Now, that's clearly intended to puncture her change message. Now, each candidate is running ads currently covering issues they think will resonate with their base. Here's a Trump ad. He murdered a father of three, sentenced to life in prison. Kamala Harris pushed to use tax dollars to pay for his sex change. I made sure that they changed the policy so that every transgender inmate would have access. It sounds insane because it is insane. Kamala was the first to help pay for a prisoner's sex change. The power that I had, I used it in a way that was about pushing for the movement, frankly, and the agenda. Kamala's agenda is they, them, not you. I'm Donald J. Trump, and I approve this message. And here's a hot button issue that the Harris campaign is pushing. I've never slept a full night in my entire life. I was five years old when my stepfather abused me for the first time. I just felt like I was alone on a planet with a monster. 
I was 12 when he impregnated me. I just remember thinking I have to get out of my skin. I can't be me right now. Like, this can't be it. I didn't know what to do. I was a child. I didn't know what it meant to be pregnant at all. But I had options. Because Donald Trump overturned Roe v. Wade, girls and women all over the country have lost the right to choose, even for rape or incest. Donald Trump did this. He took away our freedom. I'm Kamala Harris, and I approve this message. Well, just before we head to the panel, I thought I'd say a little bit about the polls. Um, there are a myriad of different polls and different pollsters, and that's led to the growth of poll averaging sites. And I like, I've extracted data from two of them, the New York Times and the Real Clear Politics sites as of this morning. The Real Clear Politics has the national average of Harris, as Harris being ahead by 1.7%. Um, averaging the battlegrounds, Real Clear Politics has Trump ahead by 0.4 of a percent. And that's interesting when it's compared with, at this point in 2020, Biden had a 4.7% lead in the battleground average. And then for what it's worth, everyone says, well, the smart money, the smart people are the people who have money at stake in the game. And so the betting odds favor Trump 54.1% to Harris 44.9%. But the national head-to-head -head is interesting, but the most important, as I've mentioned, is comes and you're polling in the swing states. And you'll see I've indicated where the RCP Poll, polling averages lie and where the New York Times averages lie. And you'll see that what they show in common is that all of these states are very close. They're within narrow margins, certainly within margins of error. But the difference on the outcome based upon where the polls are leading leads to totally different results in the election. And I think that probably just shows what a difference a small amount of votes can make in the swing states as was probably illustrated by the number of votes that would have, be, would have been sufficient to change the outcome of the last two presidential elections. Now, finally, I've extracted some trend lines for three states to try to illustrate ways to analyze the data from, and, and, and these trend lines are from Biden's withdrawal from the race to date. And the polls, and I, I've used Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Nevada as examples. The polls for all three states showed Trump with a strong lead after Biden's withdrawal, then Harris overtaking him, and then the race narrowing. Michigan shows Trump's support apparently on a current increase, but the two sites differ on whether Harris is declining or flatlining. Pennsylvania is neck and neck. Both sites show a slight dip for Harris, but only real clear politics shows an increase for Trump. Nevada shows a dip for Harris, but only real clear politics shows an increase for Trump. My only point is that maybe watching the trend lines can show what's happening on the ground because the overall margins are just so slim that it might be important if you're observing the election to see, to, to see what data you can find to indicate what is actually happening in the electorate. And that's why these trend lines, I think, are of some use. Anyway. We're now in the Q and A part, or into the Q and A part of the session. We're very fortunate to have two very distinguished pollsters, both of whom are very distinguished panelists, both of whom have been here at these sessions before and are, and I would describe as friends of the firm. First is Simon Jackman. <laughs> Simon's a pollster who worked as an academic for many years in the USA. He was an expert witness in the in the US, seminal U.S. court case of Citizens United. Until relatively recently, he was the CEO of the US Study Center at the University of Sydney, and he's now a consulting pollster. And secondly, Bruce Walpe. Bruce has been a political staffer for the Democratic Party in Congress, and more recently, um, a political staffer for Julia Gillard in Australia while she was prime minister and in her post-prime ministerial life. 
He's currently a fellow of the US Study Center at the University of Sydney, and he's a widely respected commentator on all things US politics. He's, he's a regular on the ABC and is a Sydney Morning Herald columnist. In fact, he has an article in today's Sydney Morning Herald on the US presidential election, so you can't get any more current than that. Anyway, I'd like you to welcome both panelists. <laughs> This is better than Q&A, I'll tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I'll start the question. Donald Trump has a background in professional wrestling. In professional wrestling, there's a concept known as kayfabe, where the most outrageous things are said, which everyone knows are untrue, but the characters continue saying them and the public continues accepting them, even though that's the case. Have we got to the point in US politics where there is a ceiling both on those voters who are outraged by Trump's untruths and exaggerations and those voters who are impervious to him or will actually believe them? Even in today's New York Times, there's an article headed, the Trump voters who don't believe Trump. So how significant is the issue of Donald Trump's character in this election and will it be decisive? Okay, well, first of all, it, it's wonderful to be here, Stephen. Thanks for inviting us back. Uh, don't invite us back for 2028, please. That'll be fine. Um, and uh, I, what I find is when I'm talking with people, Australians are just wrapped on this election. People are riveted on it. I mean, this room is full. I was in a session a couple of weeks ago and a, a fellow asked me, he says, what's going on with the Electoral Commission in Georgia? And I said, why does someone sitting in, in Sydney, Melbourne, want to talk about the Electoral Commission in Georgia and how they're going to count the votes. And that's how significant this is. And so really, thanks for being here. On, I think Trump is a unique character. I don't think we've seen the likes of him in modern political history. I think he has unique attributes which enable him to project himself with such effect. We've had great communicators before, Ronald Reagan, uh, Barack Obama, of course, Clinton to a degree. Um, and they have an, an effect at the time, but I think he's at a completely different place. I think um, uh, I'd like to say for a guy who lied 30,000 times in his first term as president, he's the most relentlessly honest politician I've, I've ever seen. He, um, it, he has a lot of noise that comes with him. I think his people, his base, which I put at about 45% of the electorate, I think his base um, washes the noise out because he stands for four things. He stands for immigration, walls, for, uh, nativism, he stands for protectionism, trade barriers, trade wars to protect jo your job and your livelihood. He stands for isolationism. He doesn't want the United States in foreign wars. And he stands for America first, nationalism. And the rest is noise. And so they hear him. I mean, attending, you watch video of a, of a Donald Trump rally, it's like a Taylor Swift concert. People go, they know the lyrics, they know the moves, they know the jokes, and they, and they come home and they're happy. They do the same with Trump. They go home and they're happy. And yeah, they know he's, he's talking crazy talk and sometimes really ugly talk. Enemies of the people, poisoning our blood, the enemy within. And, but they wash that out because they know if they elect him, he's going to deliver for them. And that's what keeps them intact. Um, let me also say thank you uh, to be back at the firm and, and, and back in this building and back uh, sharing a stage with, <laughs> with Bruce. Um, and uh, you are the, the, the best political scientist that we never had. Um, <laughs> well, well that, was, that, was, that was a fantastic presentation. And, um, um, uh, two, I, I do have to put you up on two things, though. Nate Silver is not a pollster. If you're going to call me a pollster, we're going to call Nate a poll averager. And pollsters <laughs> will take great that's, a, that's an important distinction in, in the world you've put me in with that label. And, um, and I wish I'd been uh, an expert witness on Citizens United. My consulting rate would be way higher uh, as a result. But no, I, I did testify in two um, partisan gerrymandering cases um, in the United States and um, have the uh, singular distinction of the only living political scientist for whom the Chief Justice of the United States has referred to my recommendation as to how to adjudicate whether a redistricting plan is partisan or not, as, quote, sociological gobbledygook. Um, PM. Um, um, uh, so uh, we'll, we'll cross that bridge with Justice Roberts one day in the future, I hope. Um, um, now, I, I, look, I agree largely, you know, with everything Bruce has just said about um, Trump. 
I think it relates to a question about the polls and a, a real why things aren't moving very much at all. This is the third cycle in which this outsized character, Donald Trump, has appeared on the ballot. Um, there isn't much more to learn about Donald Trump at this point, uh, either for people predisposed to support him or, or people who are not. And I think that's largely uh, why the polls have really seemed to have stalled. This, people are looking in incredibly fine-grained ways at these numbers, Stephen, but there's just very little, you know, you put your hand on heart. Statistically, there's just no detectable movement at this point, the, the, other than the step change that you pointed out when when uh, Harris replaced Biden at the top of the tick. And I, and I attribute that to sort of, you call it Trump fatigue or, or Trump familiarity. Um, I have been to Trump rallies. Right. Um, the Taylor Swift analogy is a little apt, but way lower energy. <laughs> yeah. Especially. Um, Especially um, the British Invasion soundtrack uh, the sort of the, 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 you know, the 60s and 70s somethings, white people. Um, um, has, um, he, has he lost the capacity to shock anymore? Uh, not you and me, but not his base, I don't think. No. Yeah, uh, right. uh, yeah. And what are the major issues in the campaign and how is each candidate handling them? There, there are three major issues, but then this whole question of Trump and the future of the country and what he's going to do, that's, a, that's another that is a big issue and it becomes the fourth issue. So the three issues are uh, the economy, um, immigration, and abortion rights, reproductive health rights. Uh, and it's always, I mean, James Carville was right with Clinton, it's the economy, stupid. And everyone who votes here knows that you're voting first and foremost on the economy, how secure you feel, what the future is. Um, uh, it, there's a parallel with, uh, between Biden and Harris and Prime Minister Albanese. Since their election, if you did a, had a, chart of a basket, a basket of goods, everything on that basket would be up between 10 and 40 percent in the past three years, and interest rates at record levels. And people are, re they are really, really squeezed. I trust they pay your bills and everything, but they're really, really squeezed. And that is the lived experience of people when they're going to the polls today. So why do you, so who owns the economy? The president owns the economy, the prime minister owns the economy. And it's just not that complicated. People like to point to the American Economy and say that it's fantastic. The macro numbers are, are terrific. Productivity is high. The investment in clean energy and high tech and all that stuff. It doesn't matter. I'm hurting. So why should I reward the party that brought me here? And I think that's, a, that's the biggest drag, frankly, on Harris. Yeah. Uh, now, the Federal Reserve cut the uh, rates by 50 basis points. Imagine if Albanese had a 50 basis point cut this week. He'd feel pretty good. And you would feel better about him. So that's one issue. Immigration is the second issue. And again, there's a parallel. This country has been engaged in, in raw immigration politics since, in modern times, at least since John Howard's prime ministership. And, uh, but there's a divergence. Here, there's almost no daylight between the Labor Party and the Liberal Party on immigration. Everyone's stopped the boats. In the United States, Democrats have been more moderate, given the demographic makeup of the Democratic Party, uh, on the issue. And that creates vulnerability. And Trump knows how to push a button more than whoever will launch a nuclear weapon. <laughs> and, and he, uh, and he uh, amps it up to um, DEFCON 5 levels. And uh, he scared people. He scared people to the extent that in Ohio, they're, where they're eating pets, of course, uh, that he can propagate that lie. People believe it. They're scared of immigrants coming in. Some immigrants, Hispanic voters, are scared of immigrants coming in because they're going to disrupt their lives. And they played by the rules and achieve things, families, jobs, and so forth. So it's a complete lie to the extent that the governor of Ohio, a staunch Republican, has to write in the New York Times that it's a lie, but he keeps telling the lie. And Vance keeps telling the lie. And it goes on. So this issue is um, one of sec your security. And, and Trump plays that to the hilt. And then the, the, um, and then the third issue is abortion rights, which are so important to tens of millions of American women and their families and associates and friends and so forth. Normally, we like to think of the arc of history as going forward. What the Supreme Court said, we're going backwards. Oh, you think you have a constitutional right that's been in existence for 50 years? We're going to take that away from you. That's the first time that has happened in modern American political life. And it's had a big impact. So when Roe was taken away, states had, to, had their own laws on abortion. Many kept the protections of Roe, but a lot did not. 
Florida enacted a six-week abortion ban. Uh, and there are other states, that's probably as restrictive as any in the country, and other states did the same. So citizens petitioned their governments. They put abortion on the ballot over the past two years, and wherever it's been on the ballot, in Kansas, in Ohio, in Indiana, Republican states, they vote to uphold women's rights. That is very telling. So we're, so for all the women, and 52% of voters are women, correct? So all the women going to the polls you know, on November 5th, they're going to do, most of them will do two, most of them will do one thing. They'll vote for uh, uh, reproductive health rights and their freedom. So are the women who vote that way going to look at the ballot and there's Donald Trump who appointed the justices that repealed the Roe v. Wade. Are they going to vote for their abortion rights and for Trump? And that I think is a big unanswered question. Are there any other issues, Simon? What about crime? Yeah, um, although that's been largely folded under the umbrella of immigration yes. in, in Trump's uh, discourse. Uh, the, the, the other thing, I, I just weave all this together and, and the slogan, make America great again, Bruce used the word nationalism and nativism. Um, I, I think there's a broader appeal, and I saw it first in 2016, this appeal, this nostalgic sort of image of America that, that Trump and his supporters sort of yearn for, uh, Trump holds out to them, where a, uh, a white man with less than a university degree could have a house in the suburbs, raise two or three kids, take them to Florida every year for a holiday, uh, perhaps once or twice in their life go to Europe. Uh, that That is flipped um, in, in, in American life. And, and, you know, against it, he counterposes not just economic threats from abroad, uh, but cultural threats from within, um, um, the fact that America has become a less white nation over time, um, the fact that uh, women now enjoy rights in the workplace and throughout society that they didn't in this uh, contra, contrast against this um, nostalgic vision of, of, of America that, that Trump holds up. Um, I don't think we should underestimate the power of that broader ensemble and that sort of that nostalgic uh, picture that, that Trump paints in the way, in particular, uh, they are making some inroads, I think they're generally overstated, but some inroads into uh, communities of colour, particularly among men of colour, yes. who, who don't necessarily uh, look upon the, the gains of their, of their, of their uh, sisters and mums and, and daughters and whatnot uh, uh, altogether positively. Um, and, and, and moreover, um, it, it doubles down... Um, on just what is, you know, since the 1960s been the dominant cleavage in American politics, and, and that is that the white electorate votes for Republican presidential candidates, and the non-white electorate overwhelmingly votes for Democratic presidential candidates. Trump is, is sort of going off, is playing into that dynamic that has been there for a long, long time now, over my entire lifetime in, in American politics since Lyndon Johnson pivot of the Democratic Party to be the party of civil rights. Um, but make no mistake about, about what Trump is, is doing. He is seeking to extract electoral advantage out of that diminishing yet ever more fearful, I think, uh, segment of the, of the white electorate uh, that is concentrated in no small measure in those three, as you refer to them as Rust Belt, Rust Belt yeah. states. We like to think of a president as someone who will bring the country together. Trump is a divider in chief. He's not the uniter in chief. And he capitalizes on that. And that's how he wants to win and then punish his enemies. Bruce, um, I don't feel strongly about it. <laughs> <laughs> Your background is obviously with the Democrats, yep. the Democratic Party. And you obviously, you, you maintain your contacts within the Democratic Party. I'm interested in your view. I'm interested in your views in relation to the Kamala Harris campaign the strategy she, she's been adopting, um, what you would say, if you were advising her campaign, what you would advise them to do now? I mean, I note in particular, it's just been announced over the, the next day, she's doing a number of interviews with black media sources that have a lot of black, me, black male viewers. I think she's even going to do an interview, I think Thursday morning, our time with Brett Baer of Fox News. Yep. So what's your take on the Harris campaign? What's she doing? What are they doing well? What are they not doing well? How are they doing it? 
What are they doing well? What are they not doing well? Mm. And also, what would you suggest they do? I, I was in the uh, I was in the states in uh, August, and and when she consolidated her position, the convention was terrific. The whole thing I called the Immaculate Conception, really. I mean, it was it was uh, no one had ever seen anything like it before. Without original sin. Without original sin, you know, <laughs> that's not bad. It's not bad. Um, and uh, and so a lot of Democrats were saying, this is over. She's got it. This is locked up. She's going to be fine. And she's not. Um, she has done exceptionally well. There was an improvement in her favorability rating of 17 points from when the day before Biden left the White House until the convention. And no one had seen such a rise in favorability before since uh, George W. Bush, right after 9-11, people rallying around the president and supporting the country. So that was remarkable. And she, of course, assumed the position without any primaries, no competition. Gretchen Whitmer didn't come. No one dissented. They said, let's go, let's unite behind her and win. So that's great. So you would have expected by now that she would have like five points ahead of Trump, just based on the goodwill and that he's capped 45. But she doesn't. And I think the advice that she's getting, uh, and I got it from Mickey Sava this morning, is go out there and tell them what the hell you're going to do. And just make it more specific, more powerful, more focused, and just show that you're you the, the specific job, not the cultural job that, that you want to do, but the specific job of how you're going to make life better for them, as well as the stuff about Trump's a danger to the country, our democracy is in danger. We don't want to do this again. People say when there's another poll, is the country moving in the right track mm -hmm. or wrong direction? Mm -hmm. And 70% uh, of Americans think the country's on the wrong track. That means they want change. She's trying to say, I'm changed for the better as well and get some of that, that frustration uh, onto her side. But I would say, get out and just let people know what your program is and really go for it. Um, Simon, on the other side, mm -hmm. can you give us a bit a description of the Trump campaign strategy, if there is, if there is such a thing, the state of the Trump campaign? <laughs> Total obliteration. If you were advising the Trump campaign, what would you do? I mean, I note that on the weekend he actually held a rally at Coachella in California, and I, and I, I think there's talk he's going to hold a rally in Madison Square Garden in he New is. York City, or he is he is going to he do is. that, and. They seem like that seems like an odd strategic move to be holding rallies in states that aren't swing states at the moment. But I'm interested in your thoughts on and your analysis of the Trump campaign. If you were advising, wow. and and I know I know advising him is difficult, but if you were advising, yeah. how, how did I get this one? Um, okay, okay. Um, uh, look, I think the strategy. Uh, the, the, Bruce talked about four issues. Um, elections are often about defining what the election is about. And um, Trump has, I mean, he keeps getting in his own way just by Trump being Trump. Um, but um, they, they have managed, despite Trump, to keep the election framed largely around issues that are very, I think, break better for Trump. The, the, the exception would be abortion. Right. Um, but, um, but, but, but abortion, I mean, it's fair to say that abortion, Trump is trying to pivot away from being an extreme anti-abortion. It's not, it's not credible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He can try, but no one's buying that. Um, anybody that thinks that that's an issue knows enough to know that that's just not a credible um, uh, uh, attempt by Trump. But, but uh, by putting, um, when, when an analyst on the other side of the planet, and I would agree with it, says that the, the four big issues are uh, uh, the economy, immigration, abortion, and the future of the country. Yeah, right. Uh, and you got wrong track numbers at, at at seventy. That's very good for the for the out party, right? And so, so to the extent that Trump hasn't, through other things that Trump does, has gotten in the way of that, um, that's been that's been a positive. I was surprised they haven't made more of the assassination attempts. Um, and again, that's just. Um, they, 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 they played into that at the convention. Um, they, they, have they already been back to the site? Has Trump already done that rally? Done that rally. Yeah, yeah. I, that, that made a lot of sense. As, as, look, not going... The, the, the other thing in terms of assassination attempts, and this is not getting as much coverage, is the Iranians have actually, are actually seriously trying to plan to kill him. They've, I think there have been some arrests. And I read a story the other day that they're actually trying also to assassinate... Um, Aids of Trump uh, of Trump in revenge for the Soleimani. Yeah, um, that ad you played with the the 
where interestingly, we didn't see real images of Trump. We saw those stylized cartoon like sketch images of Trump where he's got the right black and white, but with the red blood from from the rally and and the, and the fist that that more of that, I think is is to remind um, not just his own base, but perhaps others, that this guy has literally taken a bullet, right? And in, in you know on the campaign trail, and 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 I think that, that emotional resonance and 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 evidence of his commitment to wanting the job, if if, if nothing else, uh, playing playing up that emotional element. The other thing is, I think, to um, and 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 maybe there's more of this going on that is making it to us here in in Australian media. Um, or, um, but but understand um, tying Harris, um, you know, putting the failures of the perceived failures of the Biden administration firmly and squarely on Harris. Do not let her get away with being a changed candidate. She is the vice president. She is at best incompetent. She is. Uh, she is uh, perhaps inexperienced, perhaps incompetent, but she is. She owns the failures that Trump would like you to see of the Biden administration fairly and squarely. There's one other thing on these issues. Uh, I agree with everything that you said. Um, and that is, so you have the issue, so who's best at managing the issue? And the poll show on immigration, you know, it's like 55-40, Trump is better on immigration. Managing the economy, about the uh, 10, po 10 point uh, spread between them. So the two biggest issue, he's the one seeing mm -hmm. it as being mm -hmm. in command. And that's why he does have an edge, yeah. you have to say, yeah. Yeah. in performing. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's probably a good segue into the next topic I wanted to cover, which is polling and the state of the polling. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the first question is that the conventional wisdom is that the Democrats need to win the popular vote by at least two to three percentage points in order to win the Electoral College. That's an issue of some controversy in the commentators for this election. Will that still hold, do you think? Or will the Nate, Nate Conn of the New York Times in particular is suggesting that that won't necessarily be the case? Yeah, the yeah um, it, it is almost literally an academic point. Um, um, in the absence of good state polls, you look at the, 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 the national polls and then you sort of go, well, okay, maybe a three-point lead, it becomes very hard for a Democrat to be losing a lot of those key states if they're ahead by three nationally. And the counter that Nate Cohen makes um, in, in that recent piece is that, wait a minute, perhaps Trump is doing what Democrats usually do, and that is run up the score big time in California and New York. It sort of distorts the national picture. So you've got Hillary Clinton in particular way ahead nationally, um, but largely on the back of monster margins in California and New York. The, the, the counter argument this time around that Nate points out is maybe Trump is way ahead in Florida, a big state numerically, and that's distorting the national picture a little bit. The point is we can make that whole discussion go away by cutting to the chase. As you reminded us several times, it's not about the national numbers. It's about what's going on in those swing states. And so let's just put the national polls to one side. They're interesting things perhaps to talk about um, um, but but the the real action and where the campaign is campaign the campaigns are not running national polls the only people running national polls are media organisations for something to talk about but the the action is all in in literally three or four states Stephen yeah okay um well I was going to ask you looking at the there there are lots and lots of different polls conducted and looking at the raw polling numbers is is very foreboding. Um, Simon, are you able to give us a short summary of the different types of polling that are undertaken yeah. in the US for presidential elections and together with an assessment of the strengths and weaknesses of the type of polling? Yeah, because yeah. it gives us a bit of an insight into what sits behind the numbers we look at. Yeah, sure. So um, uh, time and money are the big constraints um, on polling in, in this context. Um, you've got to get in and out of the field pretty quickly. Uh, and, and you've only got so much money. So that pushes uh, polling towards uh, some, sometimes some very cheap methodologies like so-called robo-polling. Um, that's quite ubiquitous now in Australia. Um, the polite name for robo-polling is IVR, um, Interactive Voice Respondent, uh, um, um, is, the, is, is, the, is the euphemism. Um, that will help you um, reach certain segments of the electorate, but a lot of 
the, the state of the art, and that's true here in Australia too now, is, is blended methodologies. For instance, people that sign up to take surveys on the internet, so-called online panels, uh, are very effective. You've got sort of a captive group of respondents you know you can go to uh, pretty regularly. They get so-called points that they can use for, you know, going on holidays or buying buying things. In Australia, those skew towards younger respondents. And in Australia and the US, we tend to use phone methods to reach older older respondents. Uh, Australia, we're blessed by compulsory voting. In the United States, you've got this huge problem of, of trying to figure out who's going to vote or not. Um, often what you you end up doing is buying huge swaths of so-called commercial data that you then join up to the to the uh, voter rolls, which are, which are public databases in the US. And, and then you literally can see for a phone number that you've called, is this person, did this person vote in the last election or not? That is also a matter of public record in the United States. So you're, you're using those data and typically calling off that. And, and then in the background, you've got some internet sample as well. That's typically how the campaigns do it. Um, the gold standard is live telephone interviewing, where you've got people now, it used to be done in call centres, you'd have a, a room about this size, petitioned in the rows and people with headsets on. Now that's all done, the, the operators are doing that from their lounge rooms, from their home offices. Uh, in Australia, we often outsource that. Um, you'll hear a nice person from Fiji or from India uh, perhaps call, calling you. We simply can't afford to do much of that out of Australia because of the labour costs here. But, but, but it's essentially a blend of those methodologies, but often um, twisting the, the blend that you use as a function of time and money. But, but for almost all of them, the two dominant methodologies will be that robo methodology I referred to, plus pre-banked internet samples. And you blend the two to deal with the biases and the sorts of different populations you tend to get from both. Obviously, you can see how little change, how small changes the methodology might impact the outcome. Yeah, the, the single biggest thing there, um, the two two big things, um, the problem of not knowing whether this person is going to vote or not, is is perhaps the huge, perhaps the, the biggest issue in 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 US polling. And does does that therefore explain? why the polls got the Trump vote so wrong yeah, in 2016 and 2020, because that's the, that's the big question about the polling. And is there, is there even potentially overcompensation this time around to deal with that? Which means, because you look at the polling, you say, well, okay, well, it's so close, but the polls got it wrong in 2020, 2016. They're close. Therefore, you think Trump will win because the same error will be perpetuated. Is that a fair? Yeah, I think you, I think I think you've nailed it. I, I think you've nailed it. So what 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 bedeviled the polls in sixteen and again in twenty was that Trump has this amazing ability to pull people off the couch, who all our models and all our data tell us this person has a low probability of voting. This person, you look at their history, especially as you can figure out and they perhaps never voted or they voted once or twice, they don't look like what we would call a habitual voter. And so you, you survey that person and you wait the response. The probability of this person's actually going to vote is, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. Turns out Trump got them off the cat. He, and now he's done that twice. Um, is, has he maxed out on his ability to do that? That's the big question. I don't believe that he has. I actually think there's perhaps there are plenty more of that demographic of uh, white people with less than a college degree living outside Pencil, uh, Pittsburgh and Philly, um, but perhaps around the, around Pittsburgh, um, uh, um, there are plenty more people that look like that um, to be mobilised. The question is, you know, how can Trump reach further uh, into that well? I I I think he probably can. And I think they're probably getting better at understanding that's a huge source of votes for them. Um, and the question is, have the pollsters caught up with that ability of, of Trump to do that and to the extent they're factoring in his ability to reach into hitherto seldom mobilised or under-mobilised um, segments of the electorate? And that's what the shooting... When, when we do a polling retrospective, um, perhaps not here, but certainly in the US, there'll be a lot of gnashing of teeth, as there is after every election... 
that'll be the question that will animate all of the analysis at ex post of the polling. I'll, you know, so, so you're saying if 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 Harris wins, that'd be a surprise. Uh, no, I'm not saying. I think it's incredibly close, right. and I think the other thing that uh, it's not a polling issue. I just think, as you know, Bruce, um, what are the strengths of the democratic operation? It's ground game. Right. It's money in this case. And Harris's challenge, frankly, is can they spend the damn money fast enough? But money, as you know, buys you ground presence. You can rent storefronts. You can kit out your volunteer armies and the advertising. And the advertising. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was, was going to ask you, Bruce, it, it, it seems to me that in this election, you've prob you've got, as you pointed out, the ground game lies with with Harris, but equally, is there quite the incentive for people to get out and vote against Trump in this election oh, yes. that there was in 2020? Um, well, and this is where Harris has made a difference because uh, Biden said, "I've defeated Trump in 2020, and I have to, for the state of the country, for the future of the country, defeat him again." And so I'm staying in. Uh, and what we saw was the enthusiasm level of people who normally vote Democratic go down to record low numbers, particularly young voters, voters of color and women. And um, I mean, most voters, 60 percent, didn't like either candidate, wish, wish neither of them had been on the ticket. Right. But um, as long as Biden stayed, he could not generate votes. As soon as she comes in, that explains the 17 point rise yeah. and puts her at parity. So the, the targets are the same. She has a better ability to reach them. She's doing unconventional things. She's a, a point, uh, 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 appearing on platforms that most people haven't heard about, unless except you're, if you're young, if you're a woman, if you're a person of color, and you live in a certain place. Okay, look, I, we, this may be an unfair question to both of you, but I want to put each of you on the spot. What's your prediction for the outcome uh -huh. at this point in time? And feel free to put any caveats you want on it. Oh, you want me? <laughs> <laughs> you want me? I'll, 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 uh, there, uh, there's an apocryphal story. The Sunday before the election in 2016, uh, been a good weekend. I felt it was going a certain way. I posted on the ABC website, um, Hillary Clinton to win with at least 274 electoral votes. And every day since that has been Yom Kippur for me. And I'm... And I'm still atoning every day. And so I'm, I'm not going to answer your question. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Simon. Oh, uh, okay. I'm going to do the, 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 the <laughs> statistician thing and, and say Harris, but with barely better than a coin flip confidence in that, Stephen. Right. Um, I think she's probably just doing enough to um, shore up the blue wall. Um, um, but I, I, I wish I had more confidence. And here's the other thing. Is this election going to be decided on election night? Oh, that's a good question. Or is this election going to be decided sometime between our Wednesday and January 6th? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, I, and here's the other. I hope the polls are wrong. Yeah. I hope the polls, I hope Harris is actually on the ground, three points in front in enough states that election officials jurists, lawyers think I'm signing on to, to represent Trump and whatnot, look at the results on the ground and go, I'm not touching that. Exactly. That's what I hope. Okay. I, so I hope the polls are wrong. Yeah, I, right, think, right. Um, I think Trump will claim victory early in the night. He'll say, the polls are right. You know I won. I know I won. I won. And then, you, then the drama starts. But if the margin is clear and convincing, I think then that uh, really undercuts that posture. And I also think the other thing to watch is um, other Republican elected officials yeah. and what they have to say. Because if, in fact, the picture is pretty clear and he has lost, that meant that he has led them for the fourth straight time to disaster. And political parties want to win, and they're not winning with him. And so that begins to stop the Trump blitz. Um, just... Just um, changing the changing the scenario a little bit. What happens if Trump wins? Actually, clearly wins the election on the elect on the night, or oh, or oh, oh, in the aftermath. Um, will all sections of the Democratic Party accept the outcome? Mm. 
And apart from that, how would it, even if they do or even if, if they don't, how would a Trump win be treated on the streets of, of, of the USA? Chris? Uh, a, Trump, a Trump win among his supporters, they'll be no, no, uh, yeah. quite jubilant. Uh, the Democrat, but I'm I, think, I think the country with most of the world alongside will go into as deep a sense of depression as occurred in the depression. I think people will be extremely, extremely worried about the future if he wins. Do you think? Do you think there's any risk that the Democrats and the, I suppose the left, the left in the U.S. will not accept the verdict? And oh, do... I think there could there could well be violence, and we saw violence on the left and uh, after the murder of George Floyd and and disruption in the streets and so forth and so on. Um, if 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 Trump uh, loses, uh, I think you can see similar actions on the other side. But the margin is really everything because it yeah. gives credibility to the result. That's right. Um, the other thing that I just, I, I, there might be some episodes of, of violence, I think, concentrated in sort of, you know, some, some cities where, the, where I think the more radical left is, is particularly uh, strong. Uh, Oakland, Seattle. Is, is, uh, there, is there any possibility of Trump accepting the outcome of the of a, a, a loss? No, he no. never goes into he never goes to an election. He loses. He never has a debate. He no, loses. No, never. No, no, no. He won't. He won't accept it. He, he never apologizes. He never recants. He never retreats. He never is ashamed of anything. And will he assume? So assuming he loses that he loses the vote, and he he contests the election. Will it be different this time around because he doesn't have a vice president who presides oh. over the Senate? And how will that how will that change what might happen both at the political level and on the streets and just generally? Um, this huge question as to what a Republican majority um, on the floor of the House does. Um, and again, I think the size of the margin matters. There's a few steps before we get to Jan 6 and the VP presiding over that count, the, the electors, uh, the certifications from the state. And that is the certification within the states and, and what Republican governors do, what Republicans control state legislatures do, uh, funny games about putting up slates of electors that don't comport with or, or all that contestation of, the, of, of, as you point out, the 51 separate but related um, uh, uh, state by state contests. Um, keep an eye on 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 how close the results are there, how contestable they are, and 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 to the extent to which we have quite you know small acts of democratic heroism from in many cases Republican. You said they're state they're run by states. They're run by counties. The states are these aggregators because there's this constitutional function where they've got to send up a slate of electors to the electoral college. But the truth of the matter, that functionally, uh, there, there, there's 3,000 <laughs> uh, uh, county boards of elections, where, and that's where the rubber hits the road in, in all sorts of important practical ways. And the decisions made by people we will, we've never heard of, and I hope we never hear of, uh, it's what they do, Stephen, before I think we get to, to, to Gen 6. And the, and the Trump litigation has already started, has it not? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a great website I follow, um, Democracy Docket. It's run by Mark Elias, who is uh, perhaps the biggest election lawyer in the United States. Um, he's got a tally of cases under it. There's over 300 cases, right? Uh, and and and, um, and it'd be great if Australian law could get into this, by the way. Uh, uh, the courts here are sort of notoriously reluctant to uh, entertain um, but it'd be really good for those of us who uh, yeah. uh, uh, would love to get some expert witness work here in Australia. <laughs> so it's, it's a long way to fly back to the United States to, to be deposed and, and, and whatnot in these, in these matters. It'd be great if we had some more uh, local acts. But, but there are over 300 uh, cases working their way through the federal courts. Um, uh, there's about 200 are still active, I believe. And they're on everything from... Can you give someone a bottle of water when they're standing in line? Was that uh, was was shutting down that polling place legal or not? Um, um, uh, what are the rules around scrutineers here? Um, um, uh, when when and where can um, early voting be con be conducted? Um, it is it is um, it is kind of remarkable 
how much litigation from small beer up through to, to bigger beer um, uh, is, is currently uh, going on. Um, Can you imagine what would happen if the prime minister called up the head of the Australian Electoral Commission and said, the seat of Wentworth, I just need you to find 555 votes. You tell me what would happen. <laughs> um, look, we're nearing the end of our session, but I just, just want to ask both of you one, one question. I will be, ta I'll say this publicly, I am taking a day of leave on the 6th of November and I'll be, I will be watching the, I will be watching the election unfold in the comfort of my own home. What is it that for those of us who want to watch the election, what should be we? What should we be watching out for on the night in the US in the, in you, the you, early afternoon? You should be watching the ABC News Channel, where <laughs> I will be uh, with Casey Briggs. Uh, uh, we're doing the um, Anthony Anthony sits out US election, so it's going to be Casey Briggs and myself uh, doing the calls. This is the most serious I've seen the ABC take a US presidential election in the terms of the coverage. Uh, David Spears will be in DC. Uh, there's a big team of us here beginning rehearsals um, with live data, test data feeds out of the US. It's almost like the effort. Simon, I was going to invite you to my place, but uh, no, um, no, you can't. <laughs> but but um, but um, but I'll, I'll I'll wave from Ultimo um, um, down the TV uh, camera. But um, but the ABC is is throwing a lot of resources uh, at this. Um, I watch some of those key counties, Fulton County around Georgia, um, uh, Wayne County around uh, Detroit, um, um, just watch some of those key counties around the bigger metropolises in swing states. Uh, sometimes I'm on Secretary of States at the state level website. Sometimes I'm pushing right down to the county level. Uh, and then, um, and if you really want to nerd out, uh, you, could, you could push down to that level. The, the, the key thing, just to cut to the chase, will be, Trump, Trump will do well on election day vote, uh, but it's the postal vote and the early vote that gets counted later in the night, US time, that will favour Dems just as it did last time. And the question is, how much, a number I'm, I'm, I'm focused on, how much vote is yet to count, how much of that is male vote and trying to understand the differentials in the two pots of votes and can, in the last time it was, can Biden make up what he's behind on in votes cast on the day with votes yet to be counted and, and you know, sort of, you know, doing some statistical projection um, off those. Um, I'd watch uh, in particular uh, Pennsylvania and Georgia. If one person can carry both those states, that person is going to be president. That person is? Will be, it will be present. Oh, but, yeah. but the, pro the problem is that the figures that come in early aren't necessarily... As you, as yeah, 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 yeah. No, you're going to have to wait. Wait and and get some really authoritative um, takes on um, how much of that vote is outstanding. Well, uh, Trump yeah. was called the winner in 2016 around 4 p.m. here in the afternoon, 5 p.m. So it could well be decided on the night. Yes. Yeah. If, well, if the blowout will not. Yeah. Okay. And a, yeah. Well, with that, I think the time we've we've reached the end of our time here. So I'd like to. It's been a, a, a very informative and interesting, entertaining session. So I'd like you to thank both of our speakers in the usual way. <laughs>